Laboratories, chemical plants, sure, chemistry happens there, but, but construction sites, really? Well, in today's keynote session of the Chemistry of Stormwater, we're going to take a look at some ways maybe you haven't thought of of how chemistry plays into construction sites. So stay tuned. Well, I'm glad you could join us today because uh, we're going to talk about chemistry in a very unusual setting, and that's a construction site. But really, it is uh, fundamental to understanding how stormwater pollution prevention plans work. And so I'm going to have three guests today uh, help us understand the chemistry of stormwater at construction sites. So my first guest is Mike Lewis, a QSP with WGR. So Mike Lewis, would you come on up? Welcome, Mike, Thank you. and I'm glad you could be a part of uh, today's uh, workshop. So, Mike, uh, how long have you been with WGR? Uh, seven years. Seven years, yeah. wow. And uh, your job is the QSP, QSP right. and you go out and inspect job, job sites, sites. Sure. right? Uh -huh. But before you were at WGR, uh, what was your career? Uh, for 30 years, I was in floor covering floor and covering. construction. Yeah. So, yeah, so you kind of have the inside track uh, on understanding um, what happens at a construction site that I think many QSPs maybe don't know because they didn't spend 30 years in the trades. Yeah, it's very actually very fortunate that I was in the trade for as long as I was because I have come into contact with a lot of these chemicals that I now see on job sites um, that I wouldn't even have had a concept of whether they had a, an issue or not. Now, you, you said you were in floor covering. Uh, lots of times that we would we don't even think about that in SWIPs. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I've ever addressed floor covering in a SWIP. Sure. But uh, does floor covering uh, come into contact with chemicals or products containing chemicals? Well, sure. We use adhesives. And I, and I think back of, we used to use adhesives several buckets a day in the course of, of what we were installing. And, and once they were empty, we would stack them all and, and possibly set them outside to get, keep them out of the way. And never really thought much about it because uh, you know, at the time, all our products had changed from solvent-based to water-based, uh -huh. so we assumed that all our products were safe. Yeah, and you would think, well, floor covering, that's naturally going to be inside, so sure. it's outside of the rain, but it, it sounds like there might be exposure outside, even from uh, the floor coverings uh, trade. Oh, without a doubt. In fact, a lot of times we would be outside mixing up leveling products, you know, cementitious products, because we didn't want to make a mess in the inside the building. So Okay, so just from what I've heard you say about floor covering, we have adhesives, mm -hmm. which would have volatiles, most likely. Truly. Uh, maybe some toluene, xylene, uh, even uh, uh, maybe solvents of sorts, mm -hmm. MEK or something like that. And then cementaceous products, so we're, we're dealing with pH. Sure. But uh, there's a, a host of trades that are on any site that, you know, again, uh, lots of times SWIPs don't even get into that. But we sure. got everything from the roofers to the electricians, drywallers. Uh, and so uh, you've brought in a lot of different products that uh, might show up on a, on a construction site. Can you walk us through some of these products and where they might show up, who might be using them, and what would be the concern? Well, sure. You know, um, a lot of times before they'll prep a site for, for landscaping, well, one, you'll have the, you know, the, the chemical for the PVC glue will be used by the landscapers yeah. for putting in their products. Um, they may use some... Uh, weed killer or something to prep the land before to prep the soil before they you know start they usually have done that prior but then before they finish their hydro seed or something they may use this so this would come into play uh, cleaning of hands lubricating yeah. you know pipes that are rusted or, or or whatever a lot of times we get into you know it's real popular today to stain cement uh -huh. So the staining cement comes into play a well, lot of let's, times. Let's talk about some of these. Let's sure. let's start, let's deal with the landscapers first. And okay. Maybe we can go through some of the the subcontractors that might be on a job site. I mean, just this right here. This this famous blue stuff, the blue or blue. the blue and the purple, right? Certainly. Uh, blue being the the hot glue. Hot glue. Uh, sometimes it comes in other colors, red or something like sure. that. But uh, then the purple, uh, that's the the primer they put on there. That's that's acetone. It is. Uh -huh. And uh, 
I don't know, but uh, the the plumbers are not always the neatest uh, group, are they? No, in fact, it, because they're working on soil, all they're thinking is if it spills, it's no problem, you know. So they're, yeah. they're slopping the primer around, slopping the glue around, the more the merrier, as it were. And, yeah. And pushing it together. And you, I mean, we've done uh, home projects, right, where we're oh, sure. putting it on, and it gets everywhere. Sure. And you don't everywhere. think about it. Sure. So, so we got acetone going out there uh, that's being exposed to stormwater uh, prime, uh, glues that have uh, uh, volatiles in it. Even sure. well, some of this stuff says low VOC. Uh, you did some research on that. Yeah. What's interesting about low VOC is it says that in for uh, for instance in our floor covering adhesive, there is no adhesive out there that has no VOCs. So some their claim to fame is we have no VOCs, but in adhesives. They have to work, and so for them to work, they have to have, you know, they end up having VOCs in them. Yeah. Now, now uh, talking about the landscapers, uh, you may, you brought up a good point, because lots of times we think landscapers are at the end of the phase only, mm -hmm. um, and that's typically where we see them, but uh, clearing a site, preparing for a site, they might be actually burning some of the grass off uh, sure. using, uh, using a, uh, a pesticide and herbicide uh, or, or possibly even a pre-emergent at certain sites. So, sure, trying to keep uh, weeds under control. We might actually have something present right up at the at the start, and certainly, you know, later or during the project. If it's a long project, they're needing to do weed control. They might actually be uh, doing this, and uh, you know, people go, "Well, wait a minute, we're we're just testing for turbidity and pH." Right. Um, that. That actually is going to play in later. I, I, in the next segment, uh, Laura Wardrop is going to be talking about TMDLs, and a lot of TMDLs focus on pesticides. Sure. Um, other uh, landscape products we have uh, back here, we have um, fertilizers. Sure. When do those get applied? <clears throat> well, usually the fertilizers are when they're prepping the soil for their hydro seed, or it's in the mix, or if they're putting sod down, they'll put fertilizer down first. and so. Uh, that's always a, a thought process that we run through when I start to see landscaping. What time of the year is it? Mm -hmm. You know, are rains mm -hmm. expected? That kind of thing. Okay. All right. Let's pick a different trade. Uh, you were mentioning this uh, colorant uh, mm -hmm. that, that's a cement color. Uh, I think we have some other cement related products um, over here. Uh, can you walk us through maybe the, the, the cement, the, the tilers, the masons, uh, what what kind of products might they be exposing to stormwater? Well, a lot of their products are going to be adhesives to start with. They're going to be, or they're going to be um, using color to mix in their cement if they're doing, uh, you know, a pour that particularly a customer doesn't want any floor covering over. They just want, you know, a stained cement. So they'll be using a stain. So it may be a liquid stain uh, with an acid etch mm -hmm. in it to be able mm -hmm. to go into the cement. It may be mixed in with the cement. A lot of times you see muriatic acid used because they'll be uh, cleaning either brick or stone. Yeah. Uh, I've seen muriatic acid used in interior buildings to etch a surface to make it porous where they can add a stain or a yeah. dye. Um, and we got, I mean, we think about cement and concrete, but we also, uh, have uh, others using cementaceous products sure. that you know don't come in a ready mix truck, right? And so you might have just a even simple mortar mix, uh, and it may, may not be large scale, right? It could be well, just no. a small pro project happening. Yeah, and a lot of times there will be repairs where a mortar mix is used. So they've gone in and stuccoed the building per se, you know, residential building, and then um, they'll do something. They'll there'll be a repair, and so they will you know pull this out and make a quick patch and. And they're relatively clean and relatively not clean because they're thinking, well, you know, it'll dry and it's not going to have any effect on the soil or anything around it. Right, right. So, so when they're doing a big pour, you know, they, they've rented the, the concrete washout sure. system or they built something. Sure. But when it, a lot of times people don't think of the tilers, you know. No. And so they're kind of left off to their own devices of washing the mortar mixes out or or perhaps are using a, a colorized grout. Mm -hmm. And and these these uh, these colorants actually uh, not only is it pH, but some of the things that, you know, turn colors are heavy metals. Sure. Um, there could be high iron or aluminum uh, in these. And so uh, these are these are products that uh, 
basically, uh, first off, that QSD who's writing the SWIFT needs to get in there. Right. But then you as the QSP need to be aware uh, of how they're being used, where they're being used, and what controls need to happen. And, and there's a lot of times where there was an incident a couple of years ago where we were out on a job site where there was some discharge happening because of some storms that were coming in. And one of the um, waterboard folks showed up just as, as his routine inspection and uh, we were working with him and, and he was, we were asking him questions and he was giving us feedback. And we were, uh, had some high pH readings and we were just talking that out loud about high pH. And he said, hey, um, have you happened to notice why the pH is high? And of course, we're, we're not really thinking. I'm like, well, probably asphalt or so, you know, some curbing, some sidewalk, something's poured. He said, look back in the corner. And we looked and there was a lime truck back oh. there. And he said, do you think that lime is a, a constituent that's in the SWIP? I'm like, well, I have no idea. And so after some research, we found out, no, it wasn't yeah. in there. Yeah. So the SWIP writer really needs to get a handle on what's going to be used out there. It helps that the SWIP writer be maybe familiar with construction because they, they'd be able to look at the activities and going, oh, well, we're doing compacting during the wet season. Sure. Uh, very, very likely they're going to do some lime treatment sure. out there. Uh, but uh, other activities, you know, such as painting, uh, the painters. Uh, we always like to pick on the painters sure because do. they're an easy crowd to pick on. Yeah. Uh, but what kind of what kind of contaminants or pollutant sources might they have? We got paint here, obviously. So and we're always looking at painters. Where are you storing your product? Do you have a Connex on site? A lot of times, they're, they're the same mentality is that it's a water-based product. We can set the empty buckets outside. There's no secondary mm -hmm. containment. You see paint spilled mm -hmm. on the ground, and so there's a lot of conversations that we have uh, just when you walk out on a job site. Yeah. Uh, that they, they're just not thinking through uh, that they're doing anything to harm the environment. Yeah, and, and uh, again, we, you know, the, we look at the obvious paint, but there's a lot of other chemicals painters use that uh, are beyond that. Uh, like, uh, you know, they, they use a solvent of some sort. We have one here. I thought we had another solvent around here. Well, they use denatured alcohol, they use paint thinner. Yeah, right use, here. Here we got uh, mineral spirits. Right, they use paint thinner, mineral spirits. I've seen them use MEK. It, it just depends on what they're trying to clean. And when, they, when they're cleaning their brushes, what do you do after you got your brush all cleaned, right? Yeah, you're, they go out there going, and throw it yeah, on the ground, yes. Yeah, they even yeah, have a tool. all painters do that, right? Yeah, they even have a tool that spins it, so it can just go yeah. in, in a lot of places. Yeah, yeah. so that's awesome. So, so, you know, you're putting all this solvent <laughs> all over, and... And if that's right next to your sample point, right, that's probably something you need to think about. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm always yeah. encouraging them. Can you get away from the storm drain, please? <laughs> okay. So, so we got painters. Uh, another trade that uh, we don't think of too much would be uh, those doing pipe fitting or welding. Sure. You know, doing the piping. Uh, uh, what kind of chemicals might a pipe fitter or a welder? Be well, using. a lot of times they're using because if you just think of like sprinklers, they're using an adhesive to to you know put on put some pipe dope or pipe thread on before they put their sprinkler heads on or mm -hmm. their pipes together. Mm -hmm. um, if they if they need a, a, a you know a pipe cleaned, it, they all come with oil, natural oil yeah. on them from the manufacturer. Well, they use you know something denatured alcohol or MEK or something to clean it. Of course, with, when so. they're threading it, they're right. using a cutting cutting. They're using cutting oil. oil. Sure, uh -huh. sure. And then uh, welders obviously have their own sources of pollutants. Uh, we have solder. Sure. And then we have slag. Right. And grindings. Yeah. And so there's metals that are created. Um, you know, they're fines. And that's been a, a you know an area of concern yeah. too as well. So now let's let's uh, talk about carpenters. Okay, those that are doing the framing, uh, we think of that as being pretty clean. But are there any unique pollutant sources to to carpenters? That well, I you know when I think of carpenters, uh, a lot of times they're using you know soap markers. They're using different different kind of uh, tools to mark, and and so anything that can that can you know uh, have a residual come off of it that they use. Um, I, I'm trying to pick my brain to think about carpenters. Well, we have the obvious. We have sawdust. Oh, well, that's yeah. true. Uh, sure. And although that's not uh, chemical per se, true. Uh, it certainly is a pollutant. It's going to be a floatable. Uh, it could raise up the, the BOD or COD sure. uh, of, of the discharge. Sure. And uh, it's going to be something that we're going to pick up in the visuals. So, so that, and then if they're cutting um, treated lumber, True. That is true. another yeah. problem because treated lumber is lots of times high in uh, arsenic 
or if it's a creosote type of treated lumber, then we got some unique pollutants there. Well, that's true. And they're going to cut all that outside anyway. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. So uh, there we have, have some exposure. Uh, how about uh, um, those, uh, well, like the earth moving folks, the, the folks who are doing the grading. Now, lots of times we think, well, you know, they're just working with dirt, but they're using heavy equipment. Sure. What and kind of pollutant sources, chemicals might we see with that? So they're going to have diesel, or they're yeah. going to have gasoline, or they're going to have hydraulic fluid or transmission fluid. Yeah. So we have, <clears throat> um, we even have some here. Of course, we have oil. Sure. Uh, antifreeze. Sure. Uh, even even uh, uh, here's grease. And um, they do a lot of lubrication of parts and pieces because they're out there working in the soil, and and uh, you know things are seizing up on them. So they're always using something to lubricate some something. sort of solvent yeah. yeah yeah or or lubricant yeah very good and then uh putting the shine on the facility okay things are pretty much nearing a building but now now we want to make it sparkling clean looking good sure you do even <laughs> then we get some chemicals involved sure we do yeah they're out there washing down the building and so if muriatic acid has been used on the brick or the stone mm -hmm. they're washing it down power washing everything gets power washed into the storm drain because their philosophy is is I've got a clean site now. I'm washing everything down the drain. Okay. And uh, ours is opposite. We're like, stop. <laughs> okay. So so let's say a swip rider, a mm -hmm. QSD, or even a QSP doesn't have 30 years in the trades like you do. Sure. What's some of the ways they could really get a handle on the pollutant sources that, uh, and especially the the those that are, contain chemicals? How can they get a handle on that? Well, I think, it, you know, first I always look in the SWIP to see what is the pollutant, um, you know, list is there. But then just walk around the job site and look. Just start mm -hmm. to look. You can see, because people constantly are in habits of living a certain way, and they just think, okay, I want to keep my space clean, so I'm going to put everything outside. And so yeah. you can walk around any job site and pick up five or six chemicals being minimum. Being Snoopy. You look yeah. in the Connex boxes, just being right? Snoopy, and look yeah. in, look in the, the, where they're storing things. Right. And, or where they should store them. Or where they're not stored. <laughs> uh, how about, how about uh, SDS sheets? Well, and that's the thing. We think, okay, if you get this in your eye or if you get this on someone, do you have a way to know, you know how to treat this, yeah. what you're supposed to do, what's the first aid? Yeah. So the SDS sheets are very commendable if you have them on yeah. site and usually, for anything you're doing. Usually the bigger contractors, they have pretty aggressive safety programs. Sure. So they're going to be pretty much on top of materials bringing on site, making sure they have S sure. safety and a lot, data sheets. Sure. And a lot of times there's a safety coordinator if the job's big enough. If it's small, you know, track home builder, it may or may not, you know, have someone. But if it's large, they usually have a safety guy and he's he, he kind of oversees that. So he's helpful. And then again, uh, the Internet's awesome. Uh, you can either get the SDS off of that or uh, a um, QSD who's maybe not familiar with what chemicals the roofing industry is using. Sure. They can um, do some quick searches and, and quickly find out the types of materials that a roofer would use. And what's interesting, too, when I think about it is that when you have tradesmen on the job, there'd be a lot of products in their vehicles possibly that they would use in certain situations that may or may not be on yeah. any list. Yeah. And so in a situation that pops up, they may run to the van, get something and use it. And, and that may be another constituent that shows up on the job that is never listed yeah. or never even thought of. Now, speaking of lists, uh, there are some um, lists that have been prepared. Uh, this one is uh, Table G out of Appendix sure. G of the CASCA, the California Stormwater Quality Association's uh -huh. SWIP template. and uh, I wouldn't call this comprehensive by any means, but it is a good start. Sure. Um, to where uh, we list out types of activities, like if you're using adhesives and floor covering or cleansers, uh, what might be the uh, pollutant uh, that is associated with that, uh, in particular how how that might play out, and then what pollutant categories may may be associated with that. So. I, I believe Caltrans has a uh, version of this, Casca mm -hmm. does. Now, uh, we highlight ours in yellow uh, because, you know, I pulled this actually out of a SWIP and I say, you know, potential pollutants for this project are highlighted in yellow and take a look there. And the only one they didn't have was basically they didn't have a pool or a fountain going in. Right. Uh, but uh, most everything else was highlighted in yellow. So this is a table G from uh, appendix G of the Casca. Mm -hmm. So there are some guidances, but uh, I would I would suggest that they build on this because there's certainly lots and lots of things that haven't been thought of. Well, um, sure, and depending on on how the SWIP is developed, it may or may not even have that in there. I've seen SWIPs that have nothing in there, no list whatsoever. Yeah. 
Now SWIFTs can be revised, right? So, right. so that's kind of the QSP's job to be the eyes and ears out there. It's a fluid document. It can be changed anytime. Site maps are changed all the time. So anything inside okay. of it can be changed. All right. Well, Mike, this has been very insightful. I, I, I think uh, you've uh, showed us some products that uh, maybe we've never even thought of uh, that have chemicals and uh, as part of that chemistry happening on a construction site. So thank Great. you for being a part of today's program. Yeah, thanks for all having right. me. All right. Okay, well, that was really interesting, and, and I, I hope you had uh, some takeaways there going, okay, maybe I need to take a look at the different uh, subcontractors and activities. And I bet you if you looked at every single one of those, you would find uh, uh, pollutants you, or, or pollutant sources you hadn't even thought of and things you can add to your uh, inventories in your SWIP. Now, uh, when it comes to these pollutants, though, we have to test them. And as, the, as you can see in the construction general permit, there's mandatory testing for pH and turbidity. So to help me uh, talk about that and how that chemistry plays in that, I'm invited uh, Jonah Sonner with WGR Southwest to come up. He's a QSP. So Jonah, would you join us? All right, John. Well, thanks for having me. All right, Jonah. Well, how long have you been with WGR? Uh, coming up on five years now. Five yeah. years. So I don't right. have the 30 years in the trade, but I, I do have <laughs> yeah. know, some experience. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, and that's why we have you here is because we want to talk about field testing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something I'm sure you do a lot of, especially when yep. it's raining. Yep. So the two most common tests are what? pH and turbidity, it's actually the only two that are required by the construction general permit. And uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, all, talking about all these chemicals and things that you do have on the site yeah. can be yeah. pretty much identified by using pH or right. turbidity. And we should say they're the, the two that are routinely required. There is, of course, the non-visible pollutant right. sampling right. where if we have a spill of mm -hmm. one of those things over there, uh, we're going to have to pull out our table G we were talking about and right. figure out what to test for. But, mm -hmm. but routinely, you're right, yeah, pH and turbidity. So uh, I was wondering uh, if you could walk us through uh, the instruments we use, yeah. um, how to calibrate it, and maybe we can even test some water. Yeah, so let's go ahead and do that. We have two samples here, as you can see. And um, did you did you collect these on your way into work today? I did, I did. I saw. Hopefully you got them from a different place than Steve got his the other day. Yes, I, I did. Thankfully, uh, I don't. I don't have a construction site at a sewer plant. Um, but uh, anyway, we we talked about pH a little bit earlier sure. this week um, on on Monday, and so we're just gonna kind of breeze through this. Um, you have three standards. Some pens only have one. Some pens only have two. But the basic one is is a high, me, uh, middle, and low. So you got sure. ten, seven, and four. Sure. Um, and the pens we use are pretty straightforward. They're they're pretty idiot proof. They just have you know three buttons. So even I can use them. Yeah, even I can use them too. All right. <laughs> um, the first thing you want to do when you when you get it, you don't know who used your pen last. Uh -huh. So you always want to rinse it off. I've found that sometimes, um, you know, if you're going from site to site, if you have a site with high pH and you don't yeah. rinse off your pen, you go to a, you know another sample location that. Uh, um, very good point. Might be might be low. Yeah. And so if you don't rinse in between those, you could still have some of that residual on there, and very, then very true. And then uh, you'll you'll spike your one sample, and it'll be uh, a lot higher than than you want it to be. Okay. So, so you can see it's already you know pretty much calibrated, and you just hit uh, okay this hold button, and then it prompts you for the next samples. Now, how often do you need to calibrate your pH pen? Um, you need to calibrate it uh, the the day that you go sampling and only one time in the day. So usually okay. what we do is uh, we go out in the morning and uh, when we come into work, we just calibrate it first thing right. if we're thinking we're gonna go out sampling. And then uh, uh, then we just you know write it in a log. It's actually, sure. uh, I believe it's a permit requirement that you have to keep records of your uh -huh. calibration yes, logs. Yes, it is. Time and day you did it. And, uh, and then go from there. So we got okay. one more to do. So, and I'm so actually, you just did to 10. I'm actually going to have you do the last one while I go and switch over to turbidity. Okay. Okay. And see, so the turbidity, see if I don't mess this up. These are the ones that we use. I've seen some other ones that, that are similar to this, but we like the, uh, we like the Oakton meter. So, uh, um, you know, we, we go with that. Um, and they're all waterproof um, as well. So with these meters, um, the biggest thing to keep in mind is that you are working with turbidity, which is measuring the cloudiness of the water. And so uh -huh. um, one of the big things is you don't want to be moving it and jostling it all around because that's going to agitate the material in there. It might give you a false reading. 
Um, you also don't want to let it sit like these have been sitting for a while. And you can see like all the sediment that's on the bottom there. You know, yeah. you have your suspended solids, and and you can um, we're going to be measuring yeah. the the light passing through this. Okay. So and we brought this in because uh, we, we obviously we're on a studio stage. We can't be sampling water right away. Right. So if you can see this here, it has you know similar setup to the pH pen. Just has a calibration mode, and then all you have to do is um, put in one of these four standards in there. You hit read, and it'll walk you through the whole process. Okay. Um, and it'll just keep reading and prompting you for the next the next. Okay. Uh, well, I'll keep an eye program. on that, and. Um... So while we're going through that, and while that's calibrating, I'm actually going to start taking some pH samples here. Great. And I'm just asking for the next one, so I'll just switch that out for since, you. Since we are going to be working with the samples now, um, I'm going to put on gloves because you don't oh. really know what's on there. Like we've, you know, we've had all these chemicals on there uh, that we've been talking about, and you don't really know what's in your runoff. That's um, right. Sometimes you do, and you don't want to be handling it. Right. Um, and so it's always just a good practice to be. Wearing gloves. And, and we would assume at your typical construction site that it's going to be, you know, just stormwater with maybe some sediment. But as we just saw, there could be some yep. nasty stuff in that. Yep. There or could we could even, uh, if they're doing sewer lines, we could have raw sewage. Yeah, they, you could. You'd never know. Um, there's always commingling and run on that you have to think about. So it could be a number of factors. All so right. for the tapidometers, we have these little jars here. Um, and uh, it's the same as the calibration jars, and we're just okay. going to fill it up. They have a fill line. I think they call them the cubettes, line. right? Uh, yeah, they do. So, if you want to, if you want to sound like you know what you're doing, call it a cubette. Okay. Well, that's good information, John. <laughs> <laughs> Learn something today. So, the biggest thing that I've learned in using these is um, you don't want to get water on these vials. So, even though it's a waterproof meter. I never take it outside. I, I always leave it in the truck. I take my samples into the truck, keep it dry because what one of the things that you can do is you can actually um, scratch it. Yeah. By, um, so by anything on the wet. outside, uh, scratch, dust, water, water vapor, yeah. uh, if it's cold, condensation, mm -hmm. or even your Taco Bell grease from your yep. from the taco you just ate could could really mess up your reading. Exactly, and uh, again, it's it's all just. All right, we're almost there. We're um, gonna change this last one out. Keeping it as clean as possible. You know, nothing's perfect. Nothing's gonna, um, nothing's going to be perfect. But uh, you know, you could have readings that are just close to the NAL limit. Yeah. So you could be at you know two thirty, and fingerprint might throw it up to two sixty. You never know. And, so, and that that would be a costly mistake. Right. I mean, it really could cause some big problems. So we're going to go ahead and sample this. I think we already talked about how to how to sample pH earlier, but basically you just stick the meter in there and let it uh, let it wait till it settles out. It'll it'll hop around. And, for and a we should bit. actually we'll make a around. mention that I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. We should actually make a mention that this would actually be not uh, an approved method because we collected this water more than 15 minutes ago, right? right. And pH has to be tested within first 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Yes. So it's a little bit of a movie magic that we like to use here. Okay. But, uh, it says standby here, so you're ready to go on the okay. turbidity. And the nice thing about these meters that I like is they have a hold button. So you can actually, once you've finished your reading, you can, you can hold it so that you can, you can document that. And you can take a picture of it yeah. and uh, always have a record of what you're reading, reading And was. we like to use an app that, for our inspection, so you can actually uh, uh, take that photo and put it right into the inspection report. Yeah, correct. So again, pretty idiot proof. They've got lines telling you exactly where to put it in. Always want to make sure that your vials are clean, and then you just hit the read button. What was your pH on that on this water? It was 8.3, so it's well within the limits. And, and, uh, and the limits acceptable. would be? Um, for construction, it's, see, I've been thinking Eight, about the 8.5 and, and 6.5, 6 right? That's the NAL. And then so the we're, NAL for we're, turbidity, we we're are 8.03. Actually, we're actually over for turbidity at 397 which is not too surprising I mean looking at this water uh, that's not too surprising no nope. uh, now one of the things though I've noticed and you probably have noticed that too is it's really hard to call eyeball these this right. for turbidity right, right? Uh, because we've seen water maybe not quite this dark mm -hmm. um, but fairly close actually be, be below 250 and you know some of the things we we're talking about in, in the municipal day is like color 
because you could have color. You know, it could just be a you know brown colored or a you know a grayish color. Some tannins and, and lignans. It's not actually turbid. Yeah. So, so it's natural. It's natural occurring color from leaves from decaying decaying plant material. Right. So we've got our second one here, and just like the first, just make sure that okay. you get the fingerprints off. So we're gonna pull out this one. Don't right. leave any evidence of uh, who took the Line sample. Line up the arrows. And put then, the cap on. And the reason we go through all these steps with the cap and, and everything is because they are light sensitive. So if you have light bleeding through, completely throw off your reading. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had some uh, inspectors come back and say, hey, my numbers are really good. And then you look at their meter, they don't have caps on their meters. Yeah. And uh, they're not actually... Well, what uh, you get? We got 82.3. Wow, okay. So that's so, actually within the limits. So um, this, this water does look a little bit cloudy. Yeah. Uh, but that's well below 250, mm -hmm. isn't it? It is. We're actually going to go ahead and uh, take a pH sample of that. I forgot about that one already. Okay. We'll see what that is. Oh, and my. It's, uh, it's kind of jumping up there. You can see it. It's jumping up to over 10 now. So oh. um, that's kind of concerning. It could be, you know. So, so that would be indicative of uh, some pH altering influences from maybe concrete, yeah. uh, lime. Lime treatment, uh, yeah. Uh, we talked about mortars. Uh, yep. There's a lot of different things, so we do want to look at our activity right. and and our uh, sampling point right. and see what activities were happening upstream of that. And that actually brings up a good a good point because as you were talking about earlier with Mike, um, for somebody who with, like me who doesn't have a lot of experience, communication is key. So going to the superintendent, asking him what phase he's in, asking yeah. him what they're using on the site, you know what's going on. Can't tell you how many jobs I've walked up that lime wasn't in the SWIP. Yeah. And they're saying, hey, we're going to be lime treating next yeah. Wednesday. And it could be a uh, site-wide problem, mm -hmm. or it could be something happening very local to mm -hmm. that sample point. Correct. Uh, usually so, the worst case scenario is what happens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, uh, we, uh, you have noticed an interesting phenomenon when it comes to turbidity. Right. You and especially on this meter. You mentioned not knowing how, how uh, cloudy these samples are. So actually, we've done some, some testing of... of uh, how um, how taking a sample right away and if it's if it's really really turbid can actually throw off your readings and I think we're gonna go ahead and switch over to that video now and it'll give you a little bit more information that I can talk about. All right. During some recent sampling adventures, we've been noticing that some of our high turbidity samples have been getting abnormally low NTU readings on our turbidity meters. Using a calibrated turbidity meter, we conducted a series of experiments using a sample with noticeably high turbidity. I mean, look at that. It's nearly indistinguishable from chocolate milk. Our goal here was to see if the problem was an equipment limitation or if we had a suspension that looked more turbid than it actually was. Would you believe that our meters read this sample at 64.2? We wouldn't have believed it either until it happened. In response to this abnormal reading, we decided to let the sample settle for a bit just to see what would happen. After a 15 minute wait, we got the sample to read 924 NTU, a much more believable number based on the appearance of the sample. Another 15 minutes didn't offer much difference. So what happened with that 64.2 reading? Was there a technical malfunction, or had we found some revolutionary new substance? Just to be sure, we decided to let the sample sit for a bit longer. Our reading started to drop quite a bit. After one hour, it read 704. Another hour, and it read 420. Just for fun, we decided to give it a 24-hour wait just to see what it would do. Wouldn't you know, it read an abysmally low 9.56 NTU. A good shake, and what do you know, we're back at around 65 NTU. So what did we learn from our little experiment here? Well, we learned that abnormally low NTU readings in the field may mean you've encountered an equipment limitation. The sample could be so turbid that it confuses the meter into reporting an NTU value much lower than it actually is. But it looks like you can get around this by allowing the sample to settle for a few minutes. But be careful, don't let it settle to the point where it's no longer a representative sample. All right, well, that was really fascinating looking at uh, how uh, we measure turbidity and uh, when it comes to chemistry playing a part of construction sites and SWIP programs, you know, it's pretty obvious when we have products containing chemicals. But did you know there's actually chemistry involved with 
sediment and turbidity, and there is. So I have invited a third guest, uh, Vern Slater with Active Treatment Systems Inc., ATS Inc. He's going to come up and help us understand the chemistry of turbidity. So Vern, come on up. All right, Vern. You work with Active Treatment Systems, Inc. Yes. And uh, where, where's your office? Uh, located in Loomis, <coughs> California. Loomis. And, and what does ATS do? Uh, we do active treatment system, uh, go to construction sites, we'll treat uh, stormwater runoff uh, for turbidity and pH. Mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while there's a, an involvement of some of these other chemicals and then we'll have to bring in some specialty medias and things to do with, deal with those as well. Okay, so, so people call you in when traditional BMPs like uh, fiber roll, silk fence, uh, hydro mulch, uh, hydro seed, when that's just not quite enough. Right. And uh, usually they have a certain type of uh, soil and what, what, what kind of scenario I guess would make them want to call you or the need clays, to call you. Clays, colloidal clays, and long steep slopes are a lot mm -hmm. of conditions that we okay. see out there. Flatter sites, not necessarily as bad of a problem, but when those long steep slopes and then you have that clay and colloidal clays. Right. So when we run a Russell equation and uh, we see that the number is going up because the K factor is pretty high, okay. uh, so meaning clays, right? Clays mm -hmm. are going to have a high K factor. Or the length of slope, steepness slope is pretty long slope, steep slopes. So we're going to have a clue then that we may need some extra help because our, our A value in our Russell equation is really high. Uh, what other uh, site dynam dynamics might give us an indication that we may need an active treatment system? Well, um, a lot of uh, you know, opened areas where they mm -hmm. where they're going to have a lot have of disturbed and, soil. A lot of disturbed soils, and in areas where uh, the rainfall is going to be um, potentially ten year, twenty four hour averages so are heavy very volumes, high. Heavy volumes. Yes. And then uh, ch probably storage, right? Um, yes. If you don't have a lot of room to store it, then you're you're going to need to get rid of it quicker. Yes. Okay. Okay, so, so when, it, when we talk about turbidity, in fact, right here we have a, uh, I'll turn on the magnetic stirrer, get it going. I've had a very turbid, and you notice that even before I turned it on, it was still real, real uh, cloudy. We had a lot of suspended solids in that water. Um, but uh, uh, there's actually chemistry going on in that little beaker right there. Yes, there can, is. Can you explain to us what that is? So what's going on here is you have a lot of small particles that are anionically charged. So they're repelling each other. Okay, what's that mean, anion? Uh, it's a negative charge All right. on the particles. And so just like a magnet, you bring those negative mm -hmm. ends close to each other, they repel. Okay. And that's what's going on in these jars. Yeah, and we have Mike Lewis in here. I've seen him in his office playing with magnets before, you know, just hours <laughs> looking at that. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, 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 light charges repel and opposites attract, right? Right. So, so the negative charges of the particles and... And sometimes some small mass does not help either uh -huh. because these particles are, you know, 0 0.2 microns and smaller. Um, so they're so small, they really want to stay suspended, but that negative charge is really fighting it. So that's kind of like, you know, I'll turn this off right now, but that's kind of what's happening right there then. It's, it's on a uh, maybe a, a very microscopic level, we got a magnetic stirrer happening. Yes. It's self-agitating then, right? Yes. Because if you've got billions of these negative particles, they're just bouncing off each other like billiard balls, right? Yes, they they're just are. staying in motion. Yep. So it's like it's like our pond has got a magnetic stir happening. Right. And and I, I understand that settling times for some of these clays is how it's, long? Oh, it can be even into uh, hundreds of years. Yeah. We just uh, don't have that time to wait, do we? You know, uh, forty-seven hours. I think. I mean, I think typically mm -hmm. when I'm seeing on graphs, you're starting out at about forty-seven hours, and those are the products that we're attacking. Okay. Um, they're, they're really just not settling. Right. So, 
So if you're blessed with a fortunate side of maybe sands or silty sands or fine sands, that might settle out pretty quickly. Right. And, a, and a holding pond or a tank might do the job for you. But uh, otherwise, they're staying in, in solution longer than you probably have time to wait for it to settle out. That is correct. Okay, so the problem is what we'd call electrochemical problem. How, how does chemistry come into then solving that? Okay, so we'll take a product like that's in this bottle known as chitazam uh, acetate. Uh, it is a cationic charge, positive charged okay. polymer. And it starts out uh, in a tightly bound chain, but as soon as it starts hitting water of around 5 pH and higher, that bound chemical opens up into a long chain with a lot of positive um, attachment points. Oh, okay. So it can attract these negative particles into a big molecule that now will settle out. So opposites attract. Mm -hmm. It's going to pull them together. And they can also be filtered out. Okay. So gravity can take over yes. and, and then they're bigger and, and, then, and they won't blow right through a sand filter like, like a clay would. Right. That is correct. Okay. Well, good. Um, can, can we see how that might work? Yeah, I think we can. So You brought in some supplies. Yeah, here's some uh, water that was collected yesterday afternoon and you can see it's been sitting all night and it has a small layer of settled particles on the bottom. These are your larger particles um, that will settle out without too much help. But for the most part, this turbidity is going to be well over the 250 limit where yeah. we could discharge. This was probably uh, in the range of 1,000. Um, yeah. When it was mixed up, uh, I took a turbidity reading and it was over 1,500. Wow. In fact, our meter doesn't even go that high. It right. Only goes Neither, to 1, I had to um, dilute. Oh. And because my meter does it, it goes to 1,000. And is, is that realistic of what you would see at a construction site? Uh, typically, I see between about 1,000 and 3,000 NTU on sites where an active treatment system is needed. And just reminding everybody, the action level is 250. Right. So, so we're four to six times higher than that. Yes. All right. And so I'm going to shake this up a little bit here and just get all the suspended solids. This is as if the water was coming to you. Um, this is how it's going to come. And it's going to come into a pre-treat system. And we would pre-treat with some Kytazan. And Kytazan, I might add, is, is from the construction general permit. Um, you have to meet certain requirements for the polymer you can use. Okay. And Kytazan is one of the only polymers in the state of California that can be used for treatment on construction sites. And why is that? Um, because of the residual test. Oh, okay. And we will see a residual test here in, okay. a, in a bit. Now, I hear different names. You, you said Kytazan, you said polymer. I've heard flocculant. Right. This uh, particular material acts as a, as a coagulant and a flocculant. And what's the difference there, or, or what, what do those terms mean? what's going on, so the, when you put in, I put in a single drop in here, you'll start to see some reaction going on, and that's the coagulation step. It won't really be enough to bring this water down to a treatment um, dirtiness. And so... So when uh, I think of coagulation, I think like a... Like a a scab Blood, or yeah. something, right? Right. So, so it's, 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 it's sticking it together? Is that what that means? Yeah, it's starting to stick it together. Okay. And then you add a little bit more chitosan, and now those smaller particles come together. They form the larger coherent mass, uh, which are now your flocculation. So that's step. called flock. Yes. So that's that bigger thing. Yep. Okay. So um, I'm going to take up a little, just a little bit in this little transfer pipette. How much is that? About a milliliter? Uh, that's a milliliter in there, but I'm not going to use... Uh, let's see, four, four five, five, six. Six drops. And I'm going to set this on your table. Sure. pH of four. It's not terribly bad for you. Well, and six uh, drops in a quart. And then I'm going to do some mixing. So normally with an active treatment system, there is a static mixer that does this. Uh, that can put more energy into this jar than I can if I stood here and shook it for 
You know, now, now wait a minute. Minutes. You're you're not treating water mason jar by mason jar. Are you? No. <laughs> so static mixers are the way we do it. But that's for the bench testing. Then is what you're referring to to actually see what dosage you're going to yes. use. Yes. So I would do, right. and I typically use a mag or a uh, not a magnetic stir, but a stir plate mm -hmm. that has six positions on it, and I can do multiple doses. I can okay. do multiple polymers. Okay. To really see how and, it works. you're doing something similar to what we're doing here, but that's just to figure out how much kydosan we need is optimal. Right. All right. But when it comes to treating the water, how are you introducing the kydosan? So we use a liquid metering injection pump. Okay. And that has a calibration cylinder attached to it. So we'll do a jar test like we're doing now. We will come up with a parts per million of dose rate that's needed to mm -hmm. treat this water. Okay. Then we'll use the calibrated cylinder. Um, run a calculation, determine how many yeah. milliliters per minute to inject to reach that right. dose based on your flow, and then you start injecting. And our water's not sitting in a mason jar, it's sitting in a pond or a tanks, tank or some right. baker tanks or something mm -hmm. like that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, as we can all see right, in well, this, so already... we've got a lot going on in there. Uh, it's cleared up pretty good. And then just to show you, Time is our friend when it comes to treatment. So this is the same dirt. I treated it yesterday evening and just let it sit and it only got stirred by driving down here. Well, it um, doesn't look very stirred. Can we run yeah. a test? Yes, you we can. We got a pipette. We could uh, pipe it into here, right? Yep. In fact, I, 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 I will follow the instructions. Uh, Jonas said this is even idiot proof, so I should be able to do it. All right, so we'll put uh, some water in there. All right. Sorry about getting that water that's, on that's you there, okay. John. We're gonna wipe it off. Jonah showed us how to do this. I think we're pretty close. Yeah, we're up to the line. Okay. All right, it looks really clean to me, but in attachment F, which, which addresses uh, active treatment systems in the general permit, the construction general permit, uh, there's a different set of numbers, isn't there, yes. than 250? Yes. Do you, what is that? So once you become uh, where you're using an active treatment system, you fall under a different set of rules on turbidity. You can uh, discharge up to 20 NTUs on any single sample in a day, but you have to meet an average of 10 NTUs for that day. So this, uh, I'm just guessing this water is down pretty low, a couple of NTUs. Okay. But we'll see right now, because the eyeball is hard to tell. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, uh, it says it's reading. Uh, so, so how often do you need to test the water as you're treating? Uh, the general construction permit, I believe, requires 15 minutes after startup uh -huh. and then every eight hours during the day. Okay. Now, they as were... operators, we test more often than that. Okay, 4.72 is what it's saying. 4.72. So is that acceptable? That's very acceptable. Um, I would still run it through filters because right. trapped in here is a little bit of kytosan that could be higher than what is allowed to be discharged. Oh, now, now that is something that attachment F talks about. You mentioned residual chemical. Yes. Uh, that confuses a lot of people. I've noticed it's like the res chemi what chemical, right? <laughs> what chem what chemical are, are are we talking about? Kydazan. Kydazan. It's, it's whatever we used, right? Right. So kydazan is not the only type of uh, flocculant we could use. We could use something else, other chemicals. Right. Aluminum sulfate, polyaluminum chlorides um, could be used, but. Again, those don't necessarily have the residual right. test, so you're stuck operating in a batch mode. Okay. And which means you treat, hold, test, then discharge. But we're not talking turbidity tests, we're talking what kind uh, of test? Bioassay, a 96 hour acute toxicity test. So what some people call fish toxicity yes. testing. And, and for kytosan, the most sensitive species happens mm -hmm. to be the rainbow trout. Oh, so we're sending it to a specialty laboratory. Yes. They're subjecting uh, our water to, or fish to our water. And if so many of them go belly up or grow a third head, uh, then we have problems, right? right? That is correct. <laughs> That's the idea. Okay, so uh, the obvious uh, place you want to be then is in the continuous. Yes. So you have this uh, 
test that you can do within an hour, I believe? Uh, it needs to be within, uh, within test uh, results come within an hour. Yeah. And the, the residual test usually gives results in like 15 minutes. Okay. So, um, and the reason, the reason for that to understand is that uh, when the State Water Board looked at this technology, uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, you just look at this. Um, it works. It really works. You really can get some clean water. But what they found, I, I understand, is that some of these uh, chemicals can be very, very harmful to the receiving waters if there's too much left in. Yes. And, and what... what uh, there was a real popular polymer that came out early in active treatment systems called DADMAC. Very, very, very toxic. Mm -hmm. um, no residual test. Uh, and it used to be the premier product that was used. Mm. Uh, no more. Yeah, it's too too it's, lethal. The toxicity level of that stuff is way way too low. So so there were fish kills associated yes. with that. And and although everybody wants clean water going downstream, uh, having a bunch of dead fish is not desirable either. Correct. And so although the technology is very promising the water board saw it needed to have a certain level of control yes it did and so that involves this testing but also somebody who knows what they're doing needs to do it yes what are, what are the prereqs for for uh, somebody who's going to do a system like this so we have to send them through an eight-hour class with a certificate testing procedures have to mm -hmm. go on um, they technically have to pass with a 70 percent or better uh, the state has not designated what they have to pass by, but our company, yeah. we've right. decided if you can't pass with 70% right. or better, you don't understand so the So it's material. eight hours in the classroom. Eight hours in the classroom, and then 32 more hours in the field on, with an operator. On the job training. On the job training where you learn how to do the residual test, how to do um, your jar test, how to calculate that yeah. over to determine dose. Um, all of those properties, they have to understand safety of handling right. the coagulants, the toxicity of the coagulant. Yeah. Um, then if they're doing any of the field testing, they also have to be a QSP, right? Uh, and if they're doing turbidity or pH, they got got to have that. Um, actually, the active treatment system uh, certification is all you oh, need. Okay. All right. Well, good. So, so the problem is you can't eyeball it just as it's hard to eyeball turbidity. We can't go, uh, no, there's no residual chemical in this. Right. Um, can you show us how, how you would test for a residual chemical? Yes, I can. So, what I have here is some water samples collected. Now, this is coming from a good system that's operating well. One of these two is coming from a system that wasn't operating well and the other one does. Well, and they all look the same. And they all look the same. Um, so what we do is called a starch iodine test. Um, we run, let me grab this box out. Okay. Move some things around. And so this has got to be done in the field uh, or at least you have to be able to get your results back within an hour. And, uh, and you're monitoring for other things too, pH and turbidity and flow um, continuously. Yes. A lot of those continuously. And it, also with electronic monitoring. It data is required uh, electronically every mm -hmm. 15 minutes or sooner. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, operators, we train them to do right. it every 15 minutes to back up that system. Right. So there's some reagents that we're going to use. Got some gloves here. So to keep from cross-contamination, wear a set of gloves. Because cross-contamination, I could have already and probably have touched Kaidazan. Um, you know, if I'm handling the filters. It doesn't take much. Right, because we're, well, we we're saw only six drops for that old right. thing. We're only looking for 10 parts per million or less. Yeah. Um, and this, this particular polymer will go down, uh, will, has been okay to be at 6.7 parts per million. 
Okay. Very, very small amount. Yeah. All right. Let me know if you want me to help you with anything. Okay. So I, what is this you're putting in here? So what I'm putting in is a glass fiber filter. Okay. And this is going to, what we're going to do is I'm going to add a color enhancement solution to each one of these. So I'm doing the same thing to all of them. Then on a spike, I'm purposely going to spike it to the minimum detection level of the polymer that we're okay. searching for. Okay. Whoops, and and there's a written right. procedure for this? Uh, um. Yes, there is. The manufacturer supplies that for you. Um, I don't think I have a copy of it with me. Uh, well, but you yes. got this memorized. Yes, I do. You've done it a few times. All right, so we're putting in one of those one, glass uh, another, filters another, in each one. Yep, another glass fiber filter. Come on, get one there. And you're, you're being careful to use tweezers so that you don't uh Yeah, this uh, is a double protection. It. Yeah. You know, I'm using tweezers, I'm using gloves. All right. Let's see, there's one. And, and the last one. How long does it take you to do this if, if, I'm, if you don't have somebody interviewing you? Uh, again, it only takes about 15 minutes. Each one. Um, yeah, I'm not doing a third one. I'm only doing, because I collect one and I collect another one. So, so I'm only doing one. So your standard will stay as your standard for some time? Yes. Oops. That good was catch. A good catch, wasn't it? Let's get that back on there. Make sure it's on right. Don't want no leak by. All okay. Right. So this one is for my spike. Okay. Got blank number one, and we got blank Bring number two. Let's get these guys out of our way. All right. Okay. So color enhancement solution. Do you want me to That's open this up? Done. Sure. Okay. Please do. Open up each one. Yep. All right. And mm -hmm. so it's color enhancement solution. Yep. Technically, it's just chlorine. If okay. If anybody's interested. <laughs> okay, so how many drops? And five drops. Two, three. Four and five, all right. All right, we're adding the color enhancement to it. What if I got an extra drop in one? It's not gonna make a whole lot of okay. difference with the chlorine. All right. What really <laughs> makes a difference is the spiking solution. Oh, You can't yes. mess this because up. Because that, that's, that's gonna be our standard. That's, yes. that's our concentration, our control. And, you take a single drop of this stuff. And what is this stuff? This is chitazan acetate, but it's a very, very dilute solution compared to what is used in the field. Okay. Um, this is just to get that minimum detection limit. So one drop. Yeah, and so I'm just going to make sure drops are dropping well here before I go over there. Okay. Very good. We got one in. All right. And so there's that. We need to shake that up. Now we close all of these and shake them good. All right, I'll get this one. I'll try not to mix them up. Yeah, don't hit them into each other. We don't want broken that'd, glass and water that'd everywhere. Be, that'd be exciting. <laughs> Although I know my guys break beakers in the field. You know, we, we need a beat to go with this. Yeah. Maybe some salsa music. All right. All right, is that good? Yep, that is good. Now, we well, can take the lids off of these. <clears throat> All right, now what are you doing? Now we're withdrawing, and I've got to get the bubbles out, so I squirted out the bubbles. 
and I'm pulling up 100 milliliters of the water sample. Still got it. All right, there you go. Okay. Thread on the filter. And then you can dump it in our sink. Yes. And we'll start squirting this out. And you got to be careful not to push too hard because you can just blow a hole right through the filter and it will not collect. Can, can I pull 100 mil? Yes, sir, you can. Please do. All right. So we're going to draw it out, blow the bubbles out, and get 100 mils. Should I go a little beyond 100 and then push it back out? Uh, I start out, I get a little bit, and then push the, is there a lot of air bubble in it? Uh, only a very little one. Okay. That shouldn't be too bad then. All right. Right at 100 here. All right. And then I put this on. Yep. And thread that on. Like this? Uh, nope. This There one. you go. And be careful when you're threading that on that you don't unthread this bottom part. Okay. And then push it out. Yep. Right in there. Very carefully. Not too fast. Because you can blow it out, right? Yes. So is this going to count as my ETS training? Sure. <laughs> Only seven, seven hours and 45 more minutes to go, right? All right. We're almost done here. How about I blow those bubbles out, or blow that water out? Okay. Too. There you go. You get that. I'm going to get something to put our filters in. This feels like a real chemistry lab. All right. So now what are we doing? Now I'm just getting something that is not paper to put the filter into because the paper will react with the iodine just as the chitosan would and give us a false positive. All right. I'll let you move over here. All right. So I'm going to take the spike off that we purposely spiked to the minimum detection level. Okay, so so you took you took the papers out. You put them in these little trays, mm -hmm. and once you get done, we'll set them out here so everybody can see them. Again, you're using your tweezers, being real careful not to cross contaminate. Let's move these trays up front so people can see them. Are you, are you got to do anything yep, else just, to them? Um, now I have to add iodine. All right. And, and this one right I, here? There we go. <laughs> There's my iodine. So iodine. So uh, um, I, I've heard this test called an iodine starch test. Yes, it is a starch iodine test. Um, the chitosan is technically a starch. Okay. Uh, it does biodegrade. All right, and the iodine is is our colorant. Is that what is happening? Yep, it's giving us a reaction, and it's reacting with the starch. Yes. So, what's our objective here? So, our objective is to see the different colors. So, you see how this pattern is developed here. Uh huh. This is in our bad water number two. Yep. Number one, notice we don't have any pattern at all. In fact, let's uh, let's move these up. So here's the, here's number one. Uh, let's see if we can get this a better angle here. Here's number two. And, and you got number the three, control. my control spike. Control. Yep. So what's this telling us? This is telling us that these two are probably, this is showing you that this one has too much chitosan in the residual. Because it's, uh, it's as dark, if not darker, than, than this one. Right. And this one's clearly lighter. 
clearly lighter and as we let these sit over an hour the iodine will completely evaporate off of that and leave that white and these will have a bit of a purplish color left oh, over. Oh, okay. All right. So if you're well, a little unsure, people uh, have had a hard time doing these residual tests before. You know, colorblind people really struggle with it. Um, but letting them dry a little bit and then you'll see that purple color. All right. <clears throat> well, Vern, I really appreciate you coming out because I think a lot of people don't understand how much chemistry actually goes into just dealing with turbidity and then active treatment systems. I, I've learned it's, it's all about chemistry. So thank you for You're coming out. Welcome. Now, let's say somebody wants to learn a little bit more about how they could bring an active treatment system to their site. Right. You got a website or something? Yeah, the www.ats-env.com. So ats-env.com. Yes. All right, and they can they can look up your your phone number and give you a call and, yes, they and talk can. about the chemistry of their site. Well, thank you again for You're coming. Welcome. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, uh, I bet you didn't know chemistry gets that detailed at a construction site, and and really we rely on chemistry to solve a lot of problems. Chemistry doesn't just cause problems, but we use chemistry to, to treat the water at construction sites, to assess water sources like we saw on day two at municipal sites, and then even to uh, deal with industrial sources and identify what those sources are. So thank you for being a part of this year's uh, keynote se uh, sessions for Stormwater Awareness Week.